welcome to this week's MTD podcast. I am Colin Griffiths for MTD. It'd be a bit random if I wasn't for MTD because it wouldn't be an MTD podcast. But I've taken. Uh, we were discussing off air what I've done to you, Jeff. I've, have I taken you hostage? Uh, I think so, Colin. I think it was a case of where you're here now. Yeah, you're doing it, so you've got no choice. So this is completely unscripted. So if we if we go off tangent, off tangent, that's an oxymoron as well. I think so it could it? happen. Yeah, it could. So, for, but first of all. Jeff, who are you and where are you from? Well, firstly, Colin, thank you for uh, for asking me to take part. I appreciate that. I'm uh, I'm you Jeff won't. Gartland. I'm managing director of PSL Data Track, uh, suppliers of production control software for precision engineering companies. There you go. That's all done. Thank you very much for listening to this week's podcast. I joke, <laughs> short yeah, and sweet, <laughs> absolutely. But it's not a sales pitch about PSL Data Track. Of course, it where well, it is. Of course, it is. But we want to find out more about that. This, but we we haven't got a script. It is as I said, we've taken you hostage. We want to find out all about PSL Data Track and. What on earth would it do to my machine? I've, I'm running. I'm running an efficient machine shop. I don't need you, you guys coming in and telling me how to run my machine shop. That's, that's quite brutal. But <laughs> well, in terms of the machines, I agree totally, Colin. In yeah. terms of the machines, I'll leave that to you. But uh, well, no, don't leave it to me. That be that be your first big mistake. <laughs> you as the listener, <laughs> as a listener. But if I come, if I go, well, I've got my machine shop that's all running smoothly. The machines are making fantastic components. I've got some great engineers. How are you going to help them? Well, okay, so the business side of it. So obviously the, the precision engineering side of it, the, the engineering side of it, that's often the thing that the subcontractor is really good at. Often they founded the business because of a passion they have. And the business side is something that has to happen and it happens maybe in, not a haphazard way, that's not quite a, quite a fair term, but it just evolves. Oh, I've been like. just, some machine shops, it's a haphazard way. <laughs> we won't name <laughs> <Okay>. them. <laughs> so what DataTrack does, we, we try to simplify everything that the subcontractor has to do to run their business. So starting with the quotation, all the way through to producing the final invoice to the customer, but all the steps in between, whether it's quality, whether it's scheduling, whether it's data collection, whether it's purchasing, stock control, everything is managed through the system. Okay, don't list them all, but how many modules have you got? Uh, it's in excess of 26. Wow. And growing all the time? Growing all the time. Growing based on demand, really. So so all the modules um, are up for review on an ongoing basis in terms of adding new functionality, new features. We run an active wish list system, so existing customers can send in ideas right. for improvement, new ideas. Um, and we look at... in. We look at um, in, encompassing as many of those new features as we can, as is practical. Um, and new modules get developed as and when there's a demand. I'm having a wry chuckle to myself because has anybody sent, ever sent an idea, and don't name them, of course, we can name if you want to, but sent an idea and you've looked at it and the team have looked at it and gone, what on earth are they on about? It's happened a couple of times. Okay. Can we, can we get some names? <laughs> no, I'm not doing that. Okay, just write them down and we'll... Not on air. Okay, that's fair enough. But that's part of your... I mean. It's an off-the-shelf product, <coughs> yeah. But you're tailoring it, bespoking it, whatever you. Well, yeah. The um, the challenges, if you like, that that have to be um, addressed are: if you go for a standard system that that is purely standard, it'll be too rigid. It won't provide the rich depth of functionality you need. If you go down the route of designing a bespoke system, it will just have that one company's ideas. It'd be very expensive to develop, very difficult to support. Think of data data track as a hybrid, if you like, in right. terms of we have a core system, which is our standard product yep. with a huge number of configuration options. So we can set rules um, within the system for how it operates, as well as which modules the customer has. Right. So as an, 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 an analogy, if that's correct, when you go and buy your next Aston Martin, for example, other cars are, are available. I can go to that, that showroom and say, I want that car, but I actually want these rims and that stereo. And you can you can modify it to, to your requirements that's it exactly yeah okay. and sometimes we won't have the right tint of windows if you like and then we'll look at whether yeah. we can make that an option i could see you going down down the street with the window down <laughs> just with the stereo <laughs> blasting absolutely well let's just clarify this off air as well we found out he's a brentford brentford supporter don't want to talk football too much but uh, that's probably the, the bugatti maybe not but uh, you know well i don't know i think i think now's a great time to talk football colin because having, having having had brentford make the finals of oh. the playoffs Depend well. I'm quite could, happy. D- we don't know when this podcast is going out, so it might be after after they've got promoted. Ooh. Let's hope so. Okay, we'll see what happens. Anyway, moving on swiftly. I don't want to go through every module. I don't think people will want to go through every module, will no. they? But let's some 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 key ones. First point of call. I want to win some business. I'm quoting. Well, yeah. So the very first thing the subcontract has to do is quote for every I was going to do my gag there about Shakespeare, you know, at Two Brute, but that's <laughs> totally wasted on the audience. Sorry, I, I interject. So you've got yeah. 
Quite, quite, Nobby, quite I've, got to, I've got to ask you which Shakespeare plays that from. That's, uh, that's the only one I read at school, which is a long time ago before you asked. That is Julius Caesar. Oh, okay. As he's getting stabbed in the back at two Brute. There you go. <laughs> right, I, okay. I, I'm an educated person. I'm impressed. I did Twelfth Night. Don't remember a thing. Okay. <laughs> Moving swiftly on. Yeah, please. So, please. Oh, please. <laughs> Audience numbers are dropping rapidly. <laughs> so your subcontractor, they have to quote for every inquiry that comes in. Well, Unless they just want to obviously turn it back on some. But they've got to put a quote in. They've got to think about the process. They've got to think about the material. They've got to think about the subcontract requirements in terms of plating, heat treatment and so on. So they've got to bring all those elements together in order to quote the customer based on batch size, amortisation of set time and so on. Right. And you're, well, before then, I, I, I'm doing, I'm quoting it via, I don't know, a fag packet, an envelope, <clears throat> an Excel spreadsheet. That's taken me... An hour, it's a bit random. You'll well, you've got, you've got several um, issues with, with taking that approach. One is a spreadsheet. Yeah, it can be very flexible. The calculations you can put in can be very clever. Um, but often it will be very time consuming to actually uh, manipulate the spreadsheet. Second thing is what happens when that quote's successful? I, pan- I panic. You panic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what you do, what do you then do? You put your order on, what, another spreadsheet? Where do you, what do you do with it? Okay, Ooh. Yeah, I go to another spreadsheet, absolutely. Or I just shout across the workflow, we need this making. So yeah. Because that is a draw and go on with it. So at that point, brilliant. So if you've just shouted to your foreman, go and go on with it, you've got to record the sale somewhere. So everything you do from there on, if it's not systemized, you're going to be rekeying data, there's going to be the opportunity for error, you've got the sheer time it takes. And which subcontract business has time to burn? None of them really. They want to, they, well, A, they don't want to be doing all this. And no disrespect to your product, Jeff, it is boring stuff, isn't it? Yeah, and that yeah, quite, that's quite blunt, but I don't want to be doing admin. Well, anymore. everything you do about a system, so the system doesn't doesn't make money. Right. It can be far it can be far more valuable than that if you get it right. In terms of the machines make money, or the machine and the labour together make money because they cut something. The machine is just flat on a PC. It doesn't make money. Oh, I'm gonna no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'm disagree with you there because we've done some videos recently with your with your good self, and it does make you money because. And we've had people quote on camera saying, I was doing a job before and I was losing money. I've got PSL in, this, in there now and I've actually realised I've been losing that money. I've had to reprice it or get, or, or get rid of it. So you are making these guys money. I'd agree with you. It depends how you look at it. You're right, because it's not, it doesn't, it's, it's about making your business efficient. It's about picking yep. up issues you've got in the business, correcting problems you've got. Yep. And the approach we'll often get is they can see, the subcontractor can see the value in investing in a machine because they'll get excited about the cycle time improvements and everything else and how many access. And However, a system, where does the enthusiasm come from? It's almost a bit like talking about a new bank account or a pension to some of them. It's a system. Oh, I don't want to don't know about that. Yeah, boring, but at the point yeah. they can realise the value you get back from a system, you turn your business around and then they can start to see the improvements, the, the increased profit, um, the, the fact they've got far more customers because they're responding to quotes quickly and so on. At that point, they're switched on, they can really start to gain the enthusiasm. Definitely. You're talking about visualising things as well. Another, another part of the process of the, the, the software you provide, are the, are the, the, let's get this right, the schedule or the dashboard? The status boards. Yes. See, I know, I know my product. I've been studying this and I've been <laughs> working all your, I know all your modules and I can't even get it right. Well, um, you did say this was unscripted. Absolutely. So <laughs> your status boards, now, now wherever we go, they're always green, but they're always different. They are always different, yeah. So the idea of a status board, the idea came many years ago, um, really inspired by going to an airport. Right. Who's needed training on looking at an arrival or departures board? Oh, you yeah. just see it. Well, yeah. okay, maybe. <laughs> but most of us don't. Depends it, how long you've been in departure lounge. Well, it does sometimes. It's a point that says check-in close or gate close, you've or got you, an issue. You're an issue. Only once has it happened when you get your name called. That's when you... Oh, you've had that? Oh, absolutely. Out cold in Singapore airport. <laughs> had to run through the airport and... I fell on that plane. Yeah, it wasn't, wasn't good for anybody <laughs> else. Right. Anyway, moving on swiftly. So, yeah, our boards don't quite tell you when somebody's missed the check-in, but they're there to actually <laughs> take any data from the system. So if you visualise the board, you've got scrolling data. If it doesn't yep. all fit on one screen, the status boards will take data from any aspect of the system and then display it anywhere you've got a board around the factory where it's relevant. Right. Um, you said about no two boards being the same or you see them all looking different. We always design them to customer spec. So at the point of a customer saying... I'd like a status board. Our first question will be why. Why do you want the board? Yeah. What's it going to do for you? A bit of and vanity. It could be a bit of vanity. And there's a certain degree of, yeah, you want to enhance the presentation. You know, you show customers around, you want them to be impressed by what they can see. Yeah. But that's not enough. It's about adding value. Yeah. It should be there as an extra pair of hands. It's doing something productive for you. 
Right, OK. And some great places we've been. We're actually going to visit again shortly. Howard from Sheldon, he's got, you know, that... Was that one of the first... PSL and the, the status was one of the first things he purchased when he set the business up? Well, it ago. was. At the point at, at the point he started, I remember having a, having a conversation with him about the fact he would like to start the business with a data track system, having had prior knowledge of it from another business he'd been involved in. And the status boards were a natural uh, follow-on from getting the system implemented. Right. So... What came first, the chicken or the egg? It, well, actually, they came together with PSL Day Track and the machines. They did, yeah. Yeah, okay. Another great, I mean, we do go to a lot of fantastic energy machine shops. Jota, I remember DP down in um, Cornwall. Yeah. Don't want to have to go there. It's a long, old, well, we do want to go there. It's a great place, but they've got <laughs> they've got the status boards absolutely everywhere from them. Right? They will. And Philip will always say people like going on a Friday. I wonder why. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I don't, yeah. <laughs> Only if the weather's decent, but that's another story. <laughs> yeah. So we sort of covered off the quotations, the status boards. What about, you know, these days... I think, well, not these days, cash is king. And also stock prices are going through the roof. And also I want to be able to reduce my lead times and make sure my customers are getting supplied in timely fashion. How can you help with that? Well, yeah, I mean, the truth is a subcontract precision engineering business is a complex operation to run because you, 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 there's a machine to feed. Yep. You've got customers from various industries with their own demands. You're making a whole range of different components from different materials. It's all got to come together. You've got jobs going out for treatments, to various different subcontractors coming back, tracing it all, scheduling it all. It's a, it's a big challenge. So stock is part of it um, in terms of you can't make a job, you can't start a job if you don't have the material. Of course, you need tooling and you need various other aspects, but the material is is a, is a key part. Um, particularly at the moment, we're seeing material lead times increasing. Um, we're seeing prices of material increasing all the time. So there's a fine balance of making sure you keep enough stock of frequently used materials in stock so you don't slow down um, or you don't delay the machining yep. without holding too much that you damage your cash flow. Absolutely, because some of that, it can be quite expensive, can't it? It, it can be, yeah. But yeah. On, the other, on, the, on the other end of that process then, my customer wants a load of components and he wants to have them delivered the same day or next day, so I'm actually storing a load. Well, yeah, so some of our customers run a stock holding process um, whereby they'll make components for stock then they'll sell them on subsequent orders. Could be they're making in a large quantity for the efficiency and therefore the cost saving. But then they can deliver, like you say, same day or following day. Yeah. And they'll just take those parts from stock, but it's all fully traced. Right. And well, come, come to, we say trace, we'll come to traceability in a minute. <coughs> but also you're saying about holding stock. You can work out whether it's more efficient to say 12 lots of 50 or do the maths, one lot of 600. Well, yeah. that, that was, uh, did you see how quick <laughs> I did good. that maths? That yeah. was good like that, yeah. Let's just hope it was right. Yeah, I've seen the notes on that bit of paper. Yeah. Oh, don't give away the secret, that's not fair. <laughs> but Yeah, so in terms of working out whether it's viable or not, why not do a quotation, put a quote in for 50, do a quote for yeah. 600, see what the price difference is. Yeah. That, that amortisation of set time, uh, to be honest, that's something to recover if you can. Yeah, 12 lots of setting time, absolutely, I mean... Would it take it losing an hour each time? It depends on the complexity of the job, yeah. Sometimes much greater, Appli yeah. Well, to quote our friend Gio Albanese, application specific. Appli yes. There you go. Good now, time. you mentioned traceability. Yeah. I mean, not everybody requires that traceability for whatever reason, but a lot do. How does your system help with that? Well, traceability is integral within the system regardless. So if you're running purchase order processing as part of data track, you'll place purchase orders for material, you'll book it in through goods received, it'll be traced through material stocks together with supplier certs, mill certs and so on. There'll be an allocation history of which works orders the material's been used on. So at the point of delivery, you can declare to the customer where the material came from, which subcontractors were involved in any kind of process on the job and deliver all that information. Sometimes you may not wish to divulge your commercial information, but depending on who your customer is, you yeah. may have no choice. It may be a mandatory requirement. Okay, so that so that's gives you traceability, which can tie in with your accreditation as well? Well, it can in terms of if you're accreditated to, to whatever level, whether it's ISO 9001, 2015 or AS 9100 or whatever accreditation you're looking at, you're going to need to demonstrate traceability. Um, and the system is key to doing that, simply. Okay, so I've got a load of filing cabinets and a bit of paperwork here, a bit of paperwork there. Don't need those anymore? <sighs> to be honest, I remember going to uh, one of our customers. It's a customer you visited. I won't name who, though. It's not fair. Um, but I remember they were looking... He's, right, he's writing the name down right now. So yeah, you see that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the customer was looking at extending their factory. They were going to build on um, a storage facility on the side for their paperwork. And they were chatting to the auditor. This is about five years ago. And the auditor said, well, why don't you scan it all? Because they were under the impression they had to physically keep all the original paperwork. And the auditor said, well, no, there's no point. Because if I ask you to find that paperwork, you'll yeah. never find it. There's too much to go through. 
get it scanned, yep. start throwing away the originals once they've got to a certain age, keep them for a while. But then you've got that history long term on the system. Right, okay. And I, I'm not alluding that it was, it's Will, Will Park, I know when we saw them, those guys a little while ago, they, as part of their, um, they have the audit process to keep that accreditation. Yeah. And he said, you know what, it just, it's brilliant. It just saves me, rather than going to dig around for half an hour, try and find it and things like that. 10 seconds, well, not even 10 seconds, press a button, there's all your information, crack on with it. Yeah, we've had countless customers give us the feedback that audits used to be a whole day affair, and it was always, it was always one of those things where you'd be uh, sitting there uh, with trepidation of what they're going to find. Um, the feedback has often come back now that what they'll do is they'll sit the auditor down, I guess at social distance now, uh, and say, right, that's the button to find a works order, type in the number, print the traceability report, and there you are, you can find all the documentation that's, that's on that document. So... Not it's only, all scanned in. It's yeah, all, scanned, all in. scanned in. So not only you've got that traceability, getting that accreditation now, which could have been gosh, really daunting. Now, it's it's not easy, but it's a lot, lot easier. Well, it is because, to be honest, we find that, that most customers' quality manuals, they're written around the system. Because right. of the way the system is structured, the logical flow of information they they actually quote the system flow within their you know within their their quality manual. Okay, now move, moving on, Jeff. You've you've you, you know we've discussed this, your software. It's fantastic. So quotation through to invoicing, etc. I wanna I wanna buy the software. I'm a bit of a luddite. I, you know I'm great at making these fancy components and really tricky components and getting my five axis machine going or where where it comes to importing software and stuff like that and getting it working in my PC. I'm not really interested. What's going to happen? <laughs> it seems like a necessary evil. You've got to have it, but you don't want it. You don't want the, the difficulty of putting it in almost. Yeah. yeah. So we'll take over. We'll install this right. system for you remotely. So you don't have to get involved in that. Just just provide us with access to your PC and the server and so on. Oh, it's that simple. It's that simple. We'll oh, do okay. it. Yeah. Right. Okay. So I've got this fantastic new software. I've got one module. I've got 26 modules, whatever it might be. I need some training because I, you know, well, are you going to give me any training? Well, yeah, I mean, historically, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course. Would you like something? Yeah. Um, the training historically used to be face-to-face, on-site, uh, but things have changed, you know, particularly over the last year with what we've been through. Uh, we've all learned about Zoom, which, to be honest, a lot of people listening to this probably prior to 14, 15 months ago had no idea what Zoom was, apart from a nice lolly from maybe a long oh, time ago. No, you're going to have to Google. I think, I think most of our audience are going to have to uh, Google that. I've got no idea what you're talking about there, Jeff, Ooh. knowing full well that he knows. He <laughs> <laughs> you're going to have to... I'm sorry about this, guys, but you have to visualise a Zoom one. Is that like a rocket and had three different It was colours? a rocket, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, no, I let myself down there. I've showed my age. But anyway, <laughs> moving on. So, Zoom. It is far more modern now. I can stay at home or in my office and you can edu- educate me train me whatever exactly so the idea is now that we can actually do short sessions right. so it could be an hour it could be it could be less it could be slightly more if you'd like but we'll focus on an individual topic or right. a couple of topics then you'll have have the opportunity to practice what you've learned prior to the next session and those sessions can be um, as close together or as far apart as you'd like yeah obviously we don't want to drag it out too far but if you need we have to always be conscious with training <clears throat> that the day-to-day job has to carry on You've, you, we have to try to not disrupt the business any more than than is necessary. There's got to be some, but make it as minimal as possible. Yeah. You've, you've invested, you have invested in, in this product, this software, to make your business run better. But you want to use it to its full potential. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so I've, I've invested in this fantastic new software. Do I need a new Do, do I need a new computer? Probably not. Uh, provided you've got a decent office PC running Windows 10, to be honest, it's it's going to run data track. So everybody, everybody's everybody got one of those, haven't they? He says confidently. We come across a few people that maybe quite <laughs> haven't. <laughs> right. Can we name them as well? Name and shame? <laughs> I'll write them down for you. Okay, right. I'm, gonna, I'm getting quite a list here. <laughs> there you go. Okay, so I've got my hardware. I've got my software up and running. What else? Could, you know, we've talked about quality, traceability. Yeah, so to be honest, the traceability is obviously a key part of the quality within the system. Yep. Um, now, what is quality in terms of... It's obvious to think of quality as being the dimensional properties of a component, the surface finish and so on. That, that's obviously key, the yep. physical quality. Um, and to make sure that that's, that's managed through the system, we have gauge calibration. So the instrumentation and gauges you're going to use to check right. those components are also calibrated on the correct interval and so on. How often are you supposed to calibrate a gauge? It's going to vary based on the gauge. So right. it's not, not a fixed interval. It can also, the, the system will take into account not just time interval, but the the number of works orders the job's issued to, number of component checks. Right. And depending on the gauge, that's, that is important. 
actually, I'm working on my memory here, which can be a bit bit fuzzy at times, but that, that, that's an age thing, I think, because you say about the, the gauge calibration, I'm sure it was Charlie Caffin who said that they, he actually used his system for his, mach- for his servicing of his machines as well. So There's he, absolutely no reason he can't, and yeah. th- that's a really interesting point. Thank you. That's the way, <laughs> <laughs> the way we often like to describe data track is it's a tool. Yep. Um, and it's... I how you use described as that as well, but that's another again another <laughs> that's story. A different topic. <laughs> um, it's how you use that tool. Right. So if if you use your imagination, sometimes you can actually get more than even we realised you were getting from it. Yeah. Is, he, is he off to commission? Probably. I don't know. <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> okay. But you know, we talk about this, and he, he he's added to that by yeah. doing it for servicing his machines. Yeah. I've got this again. I, I really, I mean, if people have seen that seen your videos that we've done for you. It is off the shelf, but it's bespoke. So. Every machine shop is different. How are you going to help? How are you going to help me? How are you going to support me in that aspect? Well, the important thing is we have to, when somebody's interested in putting in a system, we have to assess the range of modules that they would like to to run their business. So it's not one size fits all because yep. that just that just doesn't work. Okay. Um, you know, you get businesses of different sizes. You know, you've been out to see uh, some of our customers that are one man bands, yep. right through to customers that are much much larger. The legend that is Andy Seuss of Bedford C and C, for example, he's certainly one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he raves about it because he's he's. We have to mention his DMG Mori because he's, he absolutely loves that. <laughs> but he's got a problem because he's too busy now. But your system, he can quote, and he's got this lovely new quote system, and he's all in personalised invoice, uh, personalised quotations, things like that. Absolutely loves it. Well, that's right. I mean, the fact that he can now turn quotes around that much quicker, yep. the, the faster you respond to an inquiry, the more likely you are to gain the business, provided the price is right, obviously. Yeah, well, how does that tie in with, I mean, with the price, there's a lot of, imp- lot of different sort of, data input there well okay so in terms of doing the quotation we won't ask you to do any more on the system than you have to regardless of how you calculate it so you have to think about the process because you've got to think about times set times cycle times yep. you can't do a quote without it you've got to think about how much you're going to be charging per hour for that um, you've got to think about the cost of material yep. you've got to think about the cost of any subcontract processes that are required to be honest one of the things that's uh, i think easy to overlook but the system doesn't how much value are you adding so if you take on a job where maybe uh, 60% of it is material cost, that's a high-risk job. Something right. goes wrong. How much material value are you going to scrap? Right, okay. So you need your decent machinists, but that's okay. But also you're looking at the bigger picture in terms of not just the material cost, the hours to machine it, the machine cost, but also you know, th- maybe even going down your profit and loss account and saying, well, actually we've got costs of the buildings, costs and things like that. Exactly. So the hourly rate you're going to charge to your yep. customer, there's obviously got to be a profit element built into it, otherwise why is the business operating? But where do you start from? How do you get that, that base overhead rate to start with? Yep. And we produced a guide um, several years ago which we enhanced and developed and so on, uh, much like the system. And that, that covers an example of how you look at the three main elements to give you that overhead rate. You've got the, the fixed overhead costs, the building and everything associated with running it. You've got the cost of equipment, together with obviously depreciation on machines and so on, and you've got the direct labour costs. All right, but it's good just to give you a remind, you know, an, an aid memoir if I if I can go a bit French on you. If that's well, all right. Well, certainly, and if you want a bit more detail about that, we can send you the guide. Okay, no problem at all. I look for look forward to receiving that. Okay, so we've done sort of the implementation. You're going to give them the support, the hourly rates. It's um, it is a, a standard a standard system, but I can have my little nuances, the wish list. I don't know what else is it. I mean, there's 26 modules. I'm, def- as I said at the beginning, not going to go through that each individual one. Any any other ones that you want to mention? No. Well, in terms of key modules, well, okay. Obviously, scheduling is an Im- sh- scheduling is a very interesting topic in terms of what does it mean. So, scheduling is often something that subcontractors will be fearful of because you think of production lines, you think about finite scheduling with tea breaks and so on. Now, if you're running a production line, you can refine the process right. and be very accurate if you're a subcontractor how do you do that you've got a mixed bag of components you're making a whole range different quantities you can never put you can't put enough preparation time in to get quite that level of scheduling right so what's right for a subcontractor is about getting that process um the, based on the order quantity working out the times needed by each operation looking at the delivery requirements looking at the subcontract time a job is out for and therefore calculating the optimum sequence to get those jobs out. It sounds way too complicated, but that's what your system does. That's what the system does. Okay, so I'm on the phone, some, my customer's on the phone shouting at me, I need that, to, I need that today. Yeah, well, at that point, they can have a look and they can see where the job's scheduled and say yeah. yes, no, or, uh, or an indifferent answer. It's, right, but it gives that they can control. See, they can see what's going on. Right. The worst thing you can do, you take a call from a customer, particularly if they're very keen on a response, you say, look, I'll check and call you back. 
yeah, although you may want th- thinking time, you've, it'd be far better to look at the system, see the answer, and tell them with confidence. Yeah, okay. And so, yeah, you don't, a lot of things engineers say is, all right, I might not be the cheapest, but you're going to get it when I say you're going to get it. That's and it. you're going to get quality product. Yeah, if you can be reliable, yep. both in terms of, like, say, quality, but also delivery. Depending on who your customers are, we've got one customer um, who said many years ago that the knock-on effect to his customer of delivering late was going to be enormous cost-wise. Yep. So they were prepared to pay for that extra bit of service to make sure they got the parts on time. That's it, nice and simple. Jeff, I think we've, co- we've covered a lot of PSL day tracks. So we've done your quotations, your traceability, looking at sort of the hourly cost and just an aid memoir. Is it an intuitive system? Is it easy to use? Well, it is, but the truth is I'm obviously going to say that. Um, <laughs> but you've got yeah. to look, No, you, it's not, Colin. It's, it's, it's <laughs> so complicated. No, of course not. But <laughs> it is intuitive, though. It is intuitive. You've got to look at what our customers say. Mm. You know, they are the real people to actually tell you what it's like to run on a daily basis. Absolutely. Well, you've seen the videos that we pr- produce for you guys as well. Yeah, and, and it's been great, to be honest. The response we get is, is, is absolutely wonderful. Do you get the support of the sort of industry associations though, as well? We're members of the BTMA. Uh, right. The British Turn Parts Manufacturers Association, yeah. GTMA, Gage yeah. and Toolmakers Association, and recently we joined Made in Britain as well. Okay, so you've got that support. So that just gives you more credibility in the industry. It does. It keeps us in touch with what's going on. Yeah. And just to reiterate, it is for engineering, the engineering industry. It's for subcontract precision engineers. That That is our main focus. There you go. So great little, po- well, great little podcast there. Anything else you know, you'd like to summarise for us, Jeff, or basically get in contact with you guys if you want to make, well, if, if you want to make your engineering company machine well, more to be, to be honest please yeah if, if you'd like to talk to us you know get in contact I, 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 you can go to our website should I state you, the website address state away so www obviously PSL <laughs> PSL <laughs> data track D-A-T-A-T-R-A-C-K dot com okay so PSL data track dot com that's it nice and simple Jeff thanks for giving us a, a very broad brush overlook at, at PSL data track but uh, going back to the videos and things we've done what the clients say they absolutely love it and it, it well ultimately it's made them more profitable and made their life a lot simpler that's exactly what they want it has and the satisfaction from seeing that is immense brilliant jeff thanks for joining us on an unscripted unscheduled mtd podcast but it's great to have you along the only downside is i'll find out you're a brent supporter <laughs> good luck in the class and hope you're in when, you're win, when this goes out thank you colin for the opportunity and uh, yeah thank you for saturday all right <laughs> cheers jeff thanks colin for listening to the MTD podcast. If you found value in this episode, please subscribe and leave a rating and review. Find more episodes on mtdcnc.com.